is the Gospel Hour, making known to this nation the Gospel of Jesus Christ. Stay tuned for today's message that was preached and recorded by the founder of the Gospel Hour, Evangelist Dr. Oliver B. Green. And now, here with our message, Oliver B. Green. Now, dear Lord God, as we continue our study of this all-important subject, where people go when they die and what they do, dear Lord God, and what they are, I pray that you'll lead us and guide us, and we'll give you the praise. In Jesus' name, amen. Now then, today, I want you to turn to John chapter 11, and we're going to read just a few verses, and of course, I cannot spend too much time on any verse, but I will do what I can in the time I have and I'm going to use this entire month to try to explain to you and point out to you the simple gospel on the subject that we're discussing, the adventure after death. What happens, where does a man or a woman, a boy or girl go the second they draw the last breath? Now, in John chapter 11, Lazarus was sick. Now, I, I'm not going to read it because if I did, it'd take almost all my time to read the chapter, so I'm just going to refer to it. If you'll begin in verse 1, you'll find what I'm saying. I'm not reading it, I'm just telling it, and then I'll read certain verses. Now, in verse 4, Jesus heard that he was sick. Uh, Jesus heard that he said, This sickness is not unto death, but for the glory of God, that the Son of God might be glorified. Now, Jesus loved Martha and her sister Lazarus. Now then, on down a little bit further, Jesus told the disciples that Lazarus, verse 11, sleepeth, but I go that I may awake him out of sleep. Then said the disciples, Lord, if he sleep, he doeth well. Howbeit Jesus spake of his death, D-E-A-T-H, death. Now notice. All right. Jesus spake of his death. And... Then said Jesus unto them plainly, Lazarus is dead. That's verse 14. Lazarus is dead. All right. Now then, Jesus went on down four days later, and Martha met him in verse 21. And Martha said, If thou hadst been here, my brother had not died. But I know that even now whatsoever thou would ask of God, God will give it thee. Jesus said unto her, Thy brother shall rise again. Martha said unto him, I know that he shall rise again at the resurrection at the last day. Jesus said unto her, I am the resurrection and the life. He that believeth in me, though he were dead, yet shall he live. And whosoever liveth and believeth in me shall never die. Believest thou this? She said, Yea, Lord, I believe that thou art the Christ, the Son of God, which should come into the world. Now then, he went down to the tomb, and he wept. Thank God for Jesus, he can weep at a tomb. Of course, today, I told you yesterday, they've taken all the crepe off the funeral coach, and they've uh, taken the black off of it. Of course, some of them are still black, but many of them, they've painted other, co other colors, and they put chromium where the crepe was, and instead of taking a corpse to the graveyard at 10 miles an hour, we take him at 25 and 30 miles an hour, and instead of mourning and, and weeping. Why, of course, there's no weeping today. Of course, there's some funerals where there's a lot of weeping, but most funerals, there's scarcely any weeping. And I'm not criticizing. I'm not criticizing. We don't call them graveyards anymore. We call them memorial parks. We've done away with tombstones, and we won't let them put up tombstones. The modern cemetery, I mean the ultra-modern ones, some of them have tombstones, but the ultra-modern cemeteries look like a beautiful nursery filled with shrubbery. Now, I'm not criticizing. I'm just showing you something. We've tried in these modern days to change death. But I will tell you this. They used to carry them to the graveyard in an old horse-drawn funeral carriage. They used to carry them in an old black draped carriage. They used to wear black and weep and wear veils and cover up their face. And the caskets used to be drab and dreary. And that we used to go very slow to the graveyard. And we used to call it a hearse. And we used to call it a funeral. And we used to call it a graveyard. And we used to put up tombstones. 
But I want to say this. In spite of the fact that all of that has been changed to fit the modern trend of the times in which we live, I say they're just as dead and they've gone out to meet God just as much as when the funeral was quite a different affair than it is today. Now, I don't believe in rolling and tumbling and hollering and squalling and, and carrying on for days and days and days over the dead. Listen, if your loved one dies in the Lord, you don't have anything to weep about except the loss of the family ties and the love. Why, bless your soul, I wept when my daddy died. I wept when my little baby boy died. And I intend to weep with my loved ones when their loved ones die. And my friends, when their loved ones die, there's nothing wrong with shedding a tear. And I'm going to shed one, and I thank God I can weep with those who weep. But I'm saying this. It doesn't make any difference how we dress up the funeral, and how we dress up death, and how we dress up the the uh, funeral wagon, and how we dress up the graveyards. They're dead. They're dead. Now, Lazarus was in the grave, and Jesus wept. It's not a crime to weep over a casket. It's not a crime to weep at a funeral. No, it's not a crime at all. It's all right. Jesus wept. Now then, they went out to the grave where Lazarus was, and Jesus said, roll away the stone, and uh, the girl said, nothing doing. I know he's been dead four days. He's decaying. He's decaying. He's been dead four days. Now then, Jesus said, didn't I tell you if you'd believe, uh, you'd see the glory of God? And uh, Jesus said, Lazarus, come forth. And he came forth, bound hand and foot. And he stood there, bound hand and foot. Now then, I've given you the account of this today to start in the uh, explanation of what happens when the body, when the, the, when the lungs collapse and when the last breath is drawn and when we depart this flesh and take our flight into the great beyond, what happens, what occurs at that moment? Now then, to the Christian first, listen. Jesus said to Martha, He that believeth in me, though he were dead, yet shall he live. He that liveth and believeth in me shall never die. Now then, I'm talking about the Christian dead first. When we accept the Lord Jesus Christ as our personal Savior, we become the possessor of the divine nature of God. Second Peter 1, 4. Read it. I don't have time to read it. I'm just giving you the reference. 2 Peter 1.4. Now listen. When we become a child of God, we are made partakers of the divine nature of God. Now listen. In Romans 8, we find these solemn words. They that are in the flesh cannot please God. That's Romans 8.8. 8. They that are in the flesh cannot please God. Now listen. But ye are not in the flesh, but in the Spirit, if so be the Spirit of God dwell in you. Now, if any man have not the Spirit of Christ, he's none of his. All right, now why am I reading these verses? Now, here's the reason. I said when we become a child of God, we, when we become a child of God, we are partakers of the divine nature of God, and the divine nature of God comes into our very heart and life in the person of the Holy Ghost of God. Now then, they that are in the flesh cannot please God, but ye are not in the flesh. Romans 8, 9. Now, to whom did he say that? He said it to the Christians in Rome. Well, now, what did he mean? Did they not have bodies of flesh? Certainly they did. But the body, my friend, is not you. Now, that's where we clash. That's where we clash. And some of you have turned up your eyebrows now, and you're going to keep them turned up. But if you'll keep that radio turned on and keep that Bible open and shut that little book of doctrine that you have and you've been following, and do, listen, I can say before God, God bears me record. I have nothing on my desk as I sit here right now speaking to you before this microphone. I have nothing before my own, uh, uh, before me on my desk but the Word of God. I have a Schofield Bible open at Romans 8. I have no notes. I have no, nothing. So help me, God. God's looking down upon my head right now. And the dear Lord knows I'm telling the truth. I don't have any books of doctrine. I'm a Baptist, but I don't have what Baptists believe before me. I have what God Almighty teaches, and that's what I'm going to follow. Now listen. 
Paul said to a group of men and women just like you and me, they that are in the flesh cannot please God, but you're not in the flesh, he said. You're not in the flesh. Now, what did he mean? Here's what he meant. When we are born of the Spirit of God, the divine nature of God takes up his abode in our hearts, in the inner man, the inner man. Listen, beloved, I can lose an arm and still live. I can lose an eye, both of them, and still live. I can lose a leg. I can lose both of my legs and still live if I get the proper med medical attention. I can lose uh, uh, some of the vital, uh, some of the organs of my body. For instance, a lung. I know precious men that don't have but one lung. I know precious people who have had part of their liver removed and one of their kidneys removed and they've had part of their stomachs removed. I know a dear man that had two-thirds, he told me, and, and he's a truthful man. He had two-thirds of his stomach taken out. He had ulcers and they operated and took out two-thirds, left him one-third of a stomach. Now, listen, what I'm trying to say is this. You can cut on this old body and cut it, cut off part of it and operate on it and cut out and cut off and, and, and uh, brother, you can live on. But listen, when that's something inside of you, we call it the heart. We call it the inner man. We call it the soul. When that something inside ceases to function, then the whole body goes limp. And in a matter of hours, it's ice cold and stiff. And that body is dead. But I want to tell you, my friend, something moved out of that body, and that's the reason that body died. Now listen, God gave up the flesh in the Garden of Eden. God said to Adam, uh, uh, Dust thou art, to dust thou shalt return. But he was talking to Adam in the flesh. Now then, what I want you to see is this. When we become a Christian, we become immortal in that we have the divine immortality of God within us, and God puts within us the spirit of the living God, the very essence of God himself, and we are partakers of the divine nature of God, and the Holy Ghost dwells within us until we depart this body. And then the spirit, the inner man, the soul, the seat of life, takes its flight to be with God. Christ in you, the hope of glory. Now, here's a verse I want you to listen to, and then I'm going to I'm going to dig into it tomorrow, and we're going to discover some rich things. Now then, Christ in you, the hope of glory. Now then, the born again are dead. They're dead, but yet they're alive. Paul said, I am crucified, I am dead, and yet I'm alive. But he said, the life I now live, I live by the faith of the Son of God. I live by the faith of the Son of God. I don't live by my faith, I don't live by my might, I don't live by my power, I don't live by my goodness, I don't live by my strength, but I live by the faith of the Son of God. All right. Now then, when we are saved, we are hid with Christ in God. Our conversation is in heaven. Our citizenship is in heaven. Our head, Jesus, is in heaven. Our foundation, Jesus, is in heaven. And we are members of his body, bone of his bone, and flesh of his flesh. Now, I'm saying all that to say this. We live in a body of flesh. The flesh dies. The flesh goes to the grave. As Martha and Mary said to Jesus, he's already deteriorating. The flesh deteriorates, but spirit and soul do not deteriorate. They are immortal, everlasting. They are the part of man that will never cease to exist. God said in Genesis 1.27, Let us make man in our own image. No, he wasn't talking about the face, the eyes, the, the hair, and the feature, but he was talking about man, a body, a soul, and a spirit. Now then, you who are born again are not in the flesh, but you're in the Spirit if the Spirit of God dwells in you. That which is born of the Spirit is spirit. That which is born of the flesh is flesh. God gave up the flesh, but God didn't give up the Spirit. God provided no salvation for the flesh. He's going to give us a brand new body. 1 John 3, 1 and 2. 
God's going to give us a brand new body. He's not going to repair this body, but He's going to give us a new body. He has already given us a new inner man. If any man be in Christ Jesus, he is a new creation. He's a new creation. 2 Corinthians 5, 17. So what I'm trying to show you today is this. The body of Lazarus was deteriorating, but the spirit and soul of that dear man was not deteriorating. When the body came out of the grave, it was tied hand and foot. It didn't walk out. It didn't walk out. It did not walk up the steps of that tomb. I've been in the tomb, and I've been down in the grave where Lazarus was. He didn't walk up the steps. His feet were tied. He didn't crawl up the steps. His hands were tied. God supernaturally gave him back in his body, alive, the miracle when Jesus said, Lazarus, come forth. Now listen, beloved. The minute that a child of God closes their eyes in death, their spirit and soul, the inner man, takes its flight to paradise. It is not unconscious, it is not asleep, but very much conscious, as we'll discover as we continue our study. But let me tell you something now. It's not so much, where are the dead now, and what are the dead doing now, that you ought to be concerned about, the thing that you need to be concerned about is where are you going when you die? It is appointed unto man once to die, and after death comes the judgment. Are you prepared for the judgment? Father, save the soul that's nearest hell today. For Jesus' sake we ask it. Amen. <laughs> 